First of all, welcome everyone to, to our, our fourth material science seminar. And uh, on another beautiful, beautiful Oregon day, we're having a stretch of these so far, to introduce Alastair Tofts. He's going to be our speaker today. And I've known Alastair for quite some time now uh, for his role in, in um, with Correlated Solutions Incorporated. And he's been using his training in mechanical engineering and business administration through the University of South Carolina. That's where Correlated Solutions is located in South Carolina. Since 2007, I think you've been there, Alastair. That's right. And his, uh, his responsibility, main one is for the company's global sales and marketing, but I can tell you that he plays a lot of other roles in the company as well. International business and customer relationships, performing product demonstrations, attending trade shows and conferences, which is where I've, I've um, seen Alistair the most, supporting customers, assisting with technical sales and product marketing and giving seminars. So the, the life of someone in a, in a busy business like Correlated is. And for those of you that don't know, Correlated Solutions is one of the main vendors of digital image correlation systems, hardware and software, um, products across the board, and has been in business for, for quite some time and, and was founded by some of the true innovators in digital image correlation realm. And they, they, I can tell you from personal experience using the products, they, um, they produce a, a very top end um, systems that, that do a wonderful job with this type of metrology. And, Alistair was kind enough to agree to, to help us with our seminar this term, and he's going to introduce digital image correlation and take us through a set of examples, which I'm very interested to see, looking at quasi-static, dynamic, thermal, and even volumetric applications. So with that, Alistair, um, thanks for joining us, and, uh, and please carry on. All right. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate you having me today. And I hope everyone's uh, doing well and staying safe. I know this uh, past year for everyone has been quite difficult and I really do miss you know, meeting people in person and attending these trade shows and giving presentations. But hey, I think uh, we're doing a pretty good job with the technology that we're luckily uh, able to use. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I think Brian covered myself very well. Um, yeah, I have been correlated a little while and I uh, really enjoy it here. I really enjoy the, um, the technology and what it brings to the table. It's really everything's every day is always different. It's always a new challenge and um, yeah, it's great. So um, I'm gonna jump right into my presentation. I got a few slides here and I, I don't wanna um, go too far over. So I'm gonna jump right into my presentation. So um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, uh, digital image correlation, you know, how it's come about to be a technology that engineers, scientists, researchers use all over the world today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how our company um, came about. And uh, I'm going to go in a little bit of theory about digital image correlation. Uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes when it comes to analyzing images for measuring you know, surface deformation and shape. Uh, but I'm going to give you a basic background about the theory. We have a lot of lots of other training material available online if you want to dig a little deeper into you know, how, how the technology works. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between traditional measurement techniques and how image correlation is, how it has advantages over those techniques. Um, talk a little bit about how a system is typically set up, you know, what type of challenges are involved. Um, and then I'm going to jump into some application examples and um, I, I do have just lots and lots of application examples. I tried to pick um, uh, a few from different um, types of applications using different types of hardware. Um, I believe there's quite a few people out there with interest in uh, microscale uh, DIC. So I have some really have a nice example uh, using microscope. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the system capabilities, uh, not just the features, but the specs, like how how, how far can we take this, this technology and uh, what type of um, measurement resolution are, are we looking at it um, utilizing different hardware? And then summary. So DIC goes back quite a long way, uh, back into the, the early 80s. Um, these are some of the early pioneering papers. Um, 
Uh, and the first one was in 1998 by Professor Wally Peters and William Ranson. Um, at the University of South Carolina, uh, these professors uh, pioneered, uh, published a paper about the matching process. Like, how, okay, is it even possible? How can we start performing matching from, from images? And then it progressed into, okay, well, how can we get good, better images? Can we scan film? Can we scan photographs? Um, you know, this is before digital cameras were even around. Um, can we, you know, get information from scanning grid patterns and then try to correlate those to, um, you know, the original and try to measure uh, displacements and strains. And all this early work was um, um, all 2D work. Um, it was really no 3D work until um, around the mid 90s. And so here's uh, again some of these papers that um, you can see here. Uh, so the first uh, software that was actually coded was was coded for was by Dr. Stephen McNeil or one of one of the very early uh, pieces of code that was written, where, and it was called Columns 512, and it would analyze images 512 by 512 uh, pixels. Um, and the way correlation works is we analyze uh, windows of pixels. We analyze what we call subsets. Uh, so back in 1983, one subset which was 31 by 31 pixels, would take 30 minutes to process. You know, the, the computing power back then was uh, much less superior to you know, even 10, 20 years after that. Um, and then we skip down to today, and you see I kind of highlighted there today, uh, we're able to process um, what, what that same subset in one four hundred thousandths of a second. So you know, super fast, 720 million times faster. It's just, you know, and, and that's come, along not just the hardware, the you know, computing power, uh, but also the software efficiency and the robustness and how to utilize uh, you know, parallel processing of multiple cores and, and, and things like that. So you can see we're much, much faster today. Um, uh, our company was founded in 1998 and that was when um, the first 3D uh, DIC software was, was uh, commercially available. And that's when our CEO, Dr. Hubert Schreier, um, came over to the US from Germany. Um, well, yeah, a few years before that and worked under Dr. Michael Sutton. And Hubert Schreier was the one that basically transferred the uh, code that was written for acad academia into a, a user interface, a commercial product. Like how can we actually like get this out there for you know, the industry to use? Um, so 1998 Correlated Solutions was founded. Um, we're the only company in the United States that actually manufactures digital image correlation systems. And we have been um, highly invested into many academia and conferences and, and um, societies that um, excel experimental mechanics and uh, image correlation. And you'll see SEM is there, Society of Experimental Mechanics. They've been around for a long time. And uh, International Digital Image Correlation Society uh, started a few years ago as well, and we've been involved um, in that. So, uh, and I de definitely encourage you if you're going to get into, you know, image correlation to take part in the, the IDEX um, society because there's lots of very interesting papers and talks and, and also committees to help uh, further the te technology. Like, how can we use it in different areas? So there's a a committee for training, there's a committee for standardization, there's a you know, committee for all sorts of different things. So I definitely encourage if you were to use image correlation to submit papers um, to IDEX and try to attend those, those, those meetings. Um, so over the years, we've spent a lot of time uh, evaluating cameras because of course we write the software to go analyze the images, but the input data comes from the hardware. So the cameras producing the images have to be very high quality, very low noise, very, um, very nice uh, image sensors. Uh, they need to be well synchronized. We need to have the ability to hardware trigger, you know, things like that. So we spent a lot of time evaluating cameras of all different kinds. So, and we're very open to this as well. You can see, we, we tell you the brands, you know, Vassler, Clear, um, ABT, et cetera. Um, and we write software to control these cameras. So um, it is important to understand that we don't support all models. And it is important if you are interested in a system to please you know, talk to us and, 
and consider you know buying the turnkey system from us because it's going to work out the box you're not going to have any issues we're going to support you 100 percent um so just that to keep in mind all right so we'll jump into a little bit of theory about digital image correlation um, a basic definition of digital image correlation is that it is a non-contact method for measuring motion deformation and strain on the surface of objects or materials, which are typically subject to some type of applied load, whether that is a you know direct load of force, or it could be you know a thermal load, it could be pressure, it could be um, anything where that surface may be uh, deforming in some way. So, image correlation is going to measure the full field. So that means we're going to measure the entire area. Um, where we get a first of all shape measurement. So you, you can see we get the X, Y, and Z coordinates um, over the whole area. So we have the two cameras looking at that one area. Uh, and that also enables us to measure displacements. So once we have started acquiring images during some sort of um, some sort of event, whether it's just rigid motion or deflection load, uh, we're going to again take another image at, uh, during that process and compare that to the reference image pair. And that gives us a UVW displacement field. And so then from the displacements, we can then calculate the strain um, tensor. So we get the whole strain tensor from the XYZ displacements. Um, and we have different strain tensors built into the software, but you get first, second principle, shear strain, bombesis strain, uh, all, all the strains. Um, and then if we have, we add the time variable to that, um, to, to the uh, image sequence, we can then calculate velocity and compute accelerations. We can take the derivative and get that. And of course, the surface curvature is, is, um, is also computed. That's basically uh, measuring the localized um, uh, inverse of the, the radius, for example. And you can also enter in your own equations and functions to be able to compute your own variables from the variables that are produced with DFC. So essentially what we're doing is we are gathering data to, um, very similar to what theoretical models will give you. So how can you um, validate a finite element model? You can either use strain gauges, extensometers, uh, different devices like that, but you don't get the whole picture. You don't get all the information on the surface. So by using digital image correlation, you can get a full field measurement, which looks just like your FEA model, and you can do some um, perform some validations very quickly. Um, so a very basic principle, you know, a lot of people ask, why do you use two cameras? Why not you use three or four? Do you get more information, more resolution? Uh, if you use multiple cameras? Um, well, the answer is actually no. Um, and we've done some experiments like adding a third camera to maybe add some more information into the system to get more uh, accurate results, but um, it really doesn't have any benefit. Um, having two cameras is sufficient to look at that one surface area and then correlate from um, one camera to the other in order to measure the shape and deformation. Um, but before we can get there, uh, we need to know how to know some information about the stereo rig, about the two cameras. Where, the, where are they relative to one another? What, what are the, what's the distances? You know, what, how can we actually triangulate the shape and get real metric data on the surface? Well, in order to do that, we perform the calibration procedure. So the stereo calibration procedure is essentially where we um, acquire images of a target. So this calibration target uh, is typically supplied as a set with each system. So you have a range of sizes for the field of view, the specimen size range that you want to measure. Uh, so we have very, very small targets that we use under the microscope. And we have quite large targets that you can use to image large areas like a wall or you know, an airplane wing or something like that. Um, so, the, but the procedures is the same. Now there are some extra steps involved with the stereo microscope and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this, the, the first procedure is the same for all systems. And what we do is we take images of this calibration target at different positions in the uh, three dimensional area where both cameras can reliably image um, from each camera. So basically think about like a cube 
um, uh, where everything is in focus and everything can move around this three-dimensional volume uh, where that, that specimen stays in focus. And we basically calibrate that, that area. Um, so we move the target around, um, we move it rigidly. We also actually tilt the target quite a lot too, which this doesn't really illustrate, but we tilt the target um, in each axis and we move it around and we acquire about 15 to 30 images. Um, if you had 15 perfect images, then that's all you really need. But um, in reality, you typically take, you know, 30 or 50 images and it, it's a very quick process. So it, it definitely never hurts to take more images than you, you actually need. And the software will analyze the images and then, you know, use the best ones and it'll, you can actually discard the ones that you don't want to use if, if they have a, a poor score. So the, so the process is to take images of the calibration target, you, we import them into the software, we analyze those images, and then it produces a score. And so the calibration score is essentially the quality of your images and your setup. So what that does is um, the, the target has uh, a known distance between the dots. So each target you flip on the backside and you'll see it has a five millimeter spacing, for example. And the software will detect that automatically too. It has some codes on the target for um, detecting the, the size. And so the way this works is it's, it's called a bundle adjustment. But basically if we, we start taking images and extracting all the centers of these markers, we know the, what the distance is between the markers. We start creating this mathematical model where we can now um, predict the location of each marker based on our model of how the stereo rig is set up. And we compare that predicted location to the actual measured location. And that's what we, that's where we get our residual error score. And that's essentially a calibration score. So the lower the residual error, the more accurate, the better your calibration is. So there's lots of different things can, that can make that good or bad. Um, some examples are bad scores will be um, where you have a reflection on the target or if it's a little bit out of focus, for example, or if it's blurry, if you move it too fast and you take an image and the exposure time on the, on the sensor is you know, longer than if you move the target too fast, you get a blurry image. So there are so there's certain things that play into uh, producing good calibration, but it is a very important and critical part of setting up a, a, uh, um, a, a system um, very, very good. Um, and when you do high magnification work, it, it becomes much more challenging and critical. Okay, so moving on. Uh, once we perform the calibration, we're then going to take some images of a speckle pattern. So I'm going to kind of skip over the step about applying the pattern. That can be another 20 minute discussion. But basically, we need to apply a random pattern on the surface. And this is typically done with uh, spray paint, or uh, we actually have a speckle kit now where you would apply a white base coat and then you have an inked roller where you can roll the pattern on there. Uh, but the important thing is the dot size. The speckle dot size needs to be around three to five pixels in diameter and about 50% coverage. So what you're actually seeing here on the screen is not the best example. Um, so there has been lots of improvements over the years on how to produce the, the, the perfect pattern. But nonetheless, I mean, it does work fairly well. It's quite robust. So a pattern like this would still give you uh, good quality data. So what's happening here is from, as we acquire images, the object is moving, it's deforming. Uh, and you can see on the left side, that's, that's basically the reference uh, image where we have one subset being uh, uh, extracted there. And within that subset, um, we have some variation between white and black dots. It's basically like to think about a fingerprint. So each one of those pixels has a value, a grayscale value. So now in, in, in memory, we can see uh, a matrix of numbers from the grayscale values. So the software uh, goes into, looks at the next image and tries to find the same window that produces the same grayscale values for each pixel. Uh, but we have to be able to allow that window to deform as well. So you can see in those um, sequential images there, the subset's actually been stretched or skewed a little bit. So we allow that subset to to move and we call that the subset shape function uh, in order to allow it to, to move and, and find the new location. So we do that across um, the whole image, but we do it from, first of all, from left camera to right camera. So we first have to perform a matching process from the left camera to the right camera. So each subset 
is then has a location, a pixel location in each camera. From that pixel location from each camera, we can then triangulate the three-dimensional coordinate of each subset. So that's how we get the shape. So we, we uh, analyze the entire speckle pattern from each camera, correlate each subset, and that we get a shape measurement. And then the second step is to uh, correlate uh, the next pair of images, one the left camera to right camera again, and then, and then finally correlate that back to where the original position was of that subset. So now we have a new coordinate and, and we can compute the displacement for that subset, each subset. So each subset um, is, it, it varies. I mean, the software actually can um, recommend the subset size for you, but the 31 by 31 pixel subset earlier I mentioned was pretty good example, pretty standard. And uh, we don't analyze every pixel. There's no, there's no need for that much overlap. So we analyze like every fifth pixel, for example, or it's, it's user defined. Um, but you can see then a one megapixel image, which has um, uh, as many as one mi million individual pixels, we, we could analyze say 900,000 of those. We wouldn't analyze all the way to the edge or your specimen typically won't take up the whole field of view. Um, but we can get nine, approximately 900,000 data points. And that's, that's a little bit excessive, especially in today's age where we have five, 12, 31 megapixel images. We just don't need to be, have to analyze um, that many subsets. So a typical uh, data set for each image pair would be somewhere between 50 and maybe a couple of hundred thousand points, depending on what kind of density you're looking for. Now, in certain applications where you want to be able to measure very close to an edge or a crack or a hole, then you'll typically use a smaller step size. You'll, you'll analyze closer because you want to get closer to that hole. So um, there's some variables there you can you can play around with the settings and the software to do that. So the end result is um, essentially you you have two images, like one from the left, one from the right camera, and this is showing a, a piece of sheet metal that is being formed um, towards the cameras. So you have a um, a die that's pressing up. And what you're seeing there is the major strain field um, on, in the contour plot. So you can see the left and right camera doesn't really seem like a whole lot of information there, but then we get this really nice three-dimensional um, strain field. So I just wanted to point out, that's kind of the end of the little, uh, training or theory um, that I'm gonna present today, but I, I do want to uh, show um, you guys, so there's, there's a couple of resources to use if you'd like to learn more. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash correlate solutions, uh, one of our engineers, um, this is Alicia Byrne, has a, a really nice presentation on the principles of image correlation. Um, so go check that out. Uh, there's also some other videos on our YouTube channel you can, you can check out as well. Um, and then also we have a free support portal. So you go to our website forward slash support and you'll see this, this support portal and there's lots of nice um, articles and uh, about DIC and and also, you know, common questions uh, about our software, our system in particular. So here are some of the, you know, basic advantages of image correlation. So again, it's a full field measurement. We're, in, we're taking um, measuring points all the way across the surface. Uh, we do have a 31 megapixel system now, so you could essentially get 30 million data points. And again, that's a little excessive, but it is achievable. Um, one of the big advantages is DIC will identify critical components because a lot of times what happens is you have a model that has a prediction uh, of your, your specimen and, and you apply a load in the model and the prediction will be a strain concentration in this location. Well, when you've actually performed the test, um, traditionally maybe you put a strain gauge there and then you compare your strain gauge results to your model, they don't match. Well, DIC takes all the guesswork out of that. You can just image the entire surface and DIC is going to pinpoint the location of the strain concentration. So then you can compare that to the model and often the uh, DIC will actually correct the model because um, in some cases that happens. Um, or if, if it's either the model's broke or your, your prototype has some manufacturing defect, uh, DIC can be a great tool for that. Um, of course, it's non-contact, which is great. You're not adding any mass to the the specimen other than a thin layer of paint. Um, there are some other methods to you know, measure specimens with no speckle pattern. Um, 
don't it, we don't typically advise it, but some uh, materials have sort of a natural pattern to them. Um, you're not gonna typically achieve the best results that way, but it, it is possible. Um, again, you don't need to know where to put gauges. You get the full field uh, measurement. And once you set the system up, uh, you, can, you can turn out um, test results very quickly. You can, you can measure tensile coupon after tensile coupon um, and, and just get all this data very quickly. Um, and we now have, uh, we've always had a, a complete system. So you have no worries about you know, hardware and software not communicating together. Um, it, is, it is very important to be able to have images streaming to a computer. Uh, you want need, the images need to be very precisely synchronized, which becomes very, very critical for dynamic applications using high-speed cameras. Um, I would not advise trying to use like two DSLR cameras to do 3D DIC. There's a whole bunch of problems and, and um, things that can happen there. Um, and this also allows us to do some other things such as uh, integrate a DAC system. So you can, uh, the system comes with a DAC, which means you can plug in your load signal, your displacement signal from your test frame, and that data would be synchronized with your images for your DIC. So when you look at strain, you know the exact corresponding load, for example. Um, and it also allows us to do some real-time processing too. So we actually show you in real time a full field um, strain measurement during a test and you can pause a test if you want to change things and uh, that becomes quite um, common in uh, I would say applications where specimens are very expensive or, or very large and you need to be able to monitor the strain field uh, in real time. Uh, what type of applications are? Well there's everything from static, quasi-static to dynamic, different geometries, different types of environments, heated, cooled, etc. Um, lots of different materials. Uh, bio, people use our system quite a bit for biological um, testing. Um, rigid motions don't affect the accuracy, so if something moves rigidly in the image, it's no problem. Systems are used in, in labs and, and used in uh, you know, very, very sensitive uh, um, environments, but also outside. Uh, and very flexible size scales. Um, our stereo microscope is uh, available from you know, a field of view of about 800 microns. Um, and uh, we also do very large samples. VIC3D has been used to uh, measure um, specimens up to you know, 50 meters across. Uh, the strain range um, is another advantage of DIC. There's, there's no, um, the only limitation to the higher strain is uh, how well the pattern can survive. You know, if you have something stretching like a piece of rubber and you have a pattern on there, uh, it can be difficult for the software to correlate subsets when the deformation is so large. However, um, we do have a feature called incremental correlation, which you click a little checkbox and then the software would then correlate deformed images to the previous image instead of the reference. So you can um, get really high strain data information. On the smaller end, uh, 50 micro strain is, is, is the limit. Um, with a very, very delicate, well set up system, we can get about plus or minus like 10 micro strain. Um, typically 50 micro strain, that's what we put on a website, it's what we claim because to get 10 micro strain is possible, but it can be fairly difficult and it, it does depend on a lot of factors. Um, so that's the range of the system. All right, so we'll jump into some fun application examples. Um, so uh, again, I tried to Kind of give you guys a, a, a wide range of different applications for the system used for, but um, I have literally probably a hundred application examples. So um, if you guys want to message me afterwards or message uh, Dr. Bay, uh, just let him know uh, if you have any questions about your particular application, we can we can discuss it with you. All right, so um, I, I have a, a quasi-static example, um, a microscope, a high magnification example, we have a high speed example. Um, an FFT vibration analysis example, uh, an example where we integrate and utilize an infrared camera so we can get temperature data as well. And then the last example is uh, volumetric DIC, which I haven't even discussed yet, but that's uh, essentially a way to measure deformations um, inside a uh, material. Okay, so jumping right into the first example. Um, this is 
a steel coupon. Basically, it is, uh, if you think of like two halves of a big steel pipe, and they're, the, the two halves are friction star welded together. So um, in this case, the, um, the company wanted to measure the strength of the weld. So they cut a section of where the weld is and wanted to perform a tens tensile test. And you can see there's a clip gauge on there. There's an extensometer to measure the deformation between those two points. But there's, there's so much going on in that weld, it's very difficult to you know, get information um, without using digital image correlation, without getting a full field measurement. So you can see here, basically, we're imaging the cross section of the weld. And uh, on the right, you can see the actual image from, from those cameras. And we're just performing a simple ten tensile test and measuring the, the uh, strain field within that well. So the sample was, um, was loaded to failure. And this was the image uh, just before failure. So on the top, you see the um, basically the kind of theoretical uh, makeup of a well. You have a nugget and you have a thermal mechanical zone, heat affected zone, et cetera. And uh, we're right below is I'm showing you the, the strain field. Um, which I believe is like first principle strain, um, which you can quite clearly see uh, where the peak deformation is in the heat affected zone. And we can extract those, those points and, and make those measurements and then uh, you know, make sure that the sample is up um, with, with holding the load that it's expected to. And a lot of uh, the data I'm showing you, um, it's all 3D data. But to visualize it, we typically overlay that 3D data onto the 2D image. And the next slide, you can see, actually see the three-dimensional um, data. So there you can see that as it was being loaded, the weld zone was actually moving you know, away from the cameras. You can see that it's deformed um, like into, the, into, the, into the area. So again, we're just showing you the same data set, just uh, actually in 3D. And on the right there, you see it. Um, uh, on, the, on the actual image. And there's a, there's a red line there, it's a little difficult to see, but that's where we compared the, the strain uh, from the DIC to the extensometer, which matched up very well, but you're missing everything. <laughs> you, you got the extensometer showing the, the strain between those two points, but all the strain concentration is between those points. So you know, how else do you, do you measure it without uh, using DIC or some smaller device? All right, so um, application two, um, we're going to talk about the microscope system. So um, first of all, I wanted to explain to you guys the difference of, of systems that um, are utilized to measure high magnification uh, specimens. So uh, scanning electron microscope, which you see on the left column there, um, you can get extremely high magnifications with SEM. Um, it, it, can be, it can be quite difficult to get a speckle pattern on a uh, surface of a sample that's set small. Typically, it's, a lot of times it's impossible. You just have to rely on you know, the natural sort of features within the image and, and correlate as best you can. Uh, but it is possible. Um, the one thing we have to do is measure the, um, the drift in the SEM. So we take images at different time steps and analyze those images with the times in the software, and we can correct for that drift. Um, moving on to big 3D macro. So uh, macro uh, basically just means it's a pretty common term using optics where you can get high magnification, but basically the limit's one to one. It's basically one X. So your field of view would be equal to the size of the image sensor. Um, so for example, a five megapixel uh, image sensor is about seven by nine millimeters. So that's about the smallest field of view you can get. But you can mount the two cameras on a standard bar, use extension tubes with lenses, or some lenses don't even need extension tubes. And uh, it's a fairly easy setup. Now it is quite delicate, so it's, you have to be careful uh, that vibrations are isolated and things like that. Um, but that's a standard system just using some standard off-the-shelf lenses. And you can get a fairly small field of view that way. Um, next we have is the microscope system, oh, sorry, micro 
DIC system. So this is a, uh, a new system, fairly new system um, that's been developed um, by our partners in Germany. And uh, it's essentially where they do a tilt, tilt shift uh, Schlein fluke setup with the system. So they're essentially like tilting the um, sensors um, and having the lenses at a certain angle so that you get better overlap. So you get better, more parallel depth of field. Because at these, the macro system has challenges where um, because the cameras are at an angle, your depth of field is very shallow. So the edges of your images may, may be blurry. So the, the micro DA system eliminates that. It makes it, it, it creates a parallel depth of field on the surface of the specimen of each camera. So it's really, um, really nice setup. And that's available in 0.5 to 2X. So again, with the, uh, two, with the five megapixel um, system, you can you get a 4.5 millimeter field of view. Um, next one is a stereo microscope. So this utilizes a, a stereo microscope uh, with a customized beam splitter that's attached to the back of the zoom body. And then we have two cameras mounted on the zoom body, which um, then uh, capture the light through the single objective lens. So they have one objective lens, like two light paths hitting the two image sensors, and we're able to get a, a, a higher magnification uh, down to about 0.8 millimeters. Um, we have to be very kind of aware that um, there is a diffraction limitation um, with optics and cameras. So even though you have a really small field of view, um, it's almost like you're doing a digital zoom because you're not benefiting much from, from zooming in further because of the diffraction limitation. Okay, so um, here's just a, more, a bit more explanation of each. So this would be uh, talking about the scanning electron microscope. And so for 2D system, um, you basically just use our software and you use our scanning electron microscope system uh, to acquire the images and then you analyze the images with our software. Um, the 3D version using SEM is, is extremely difficult. Um, it's been performed once at University of South Carolina, it took a very, very long time to get any meaningful data. And I wasn't actually with the company when they did this. And I've always been told it was just too much work for, for what you got out of it. So um, I did want to mention, mention that there. And OK, so this is the um, a system using macro lenses. So you can see, even though these are standard sort of off the shelf lenses, we're using uh, extension tubes. Um, very long extension tubes in order to get the, uh, the highest magnification we can, or actually more of a longer working distance. Um, and then you see we have the cameras mounted on uh, fine adjustment mounts. So you want to, because you need to be able to optimize the overlap. Because when you're looking at um, something very small and you put your, ca your uh, cameras on standard mounts, um, one might be machined a little bit different than the other. We actually used to see that a lot. We used to have to shim you know, mounts because one was offset from the other. And it's extremely important that the cameras are, stay rigid to one another. So you, you really need a custom mounting solution for this type of work. And that's what we have here. We have a, we have a fine adjustment stereo mounts and then the mounts are actually on these uh, linear stages so we can move them towards or away from the specimen. And then we have a, a very focusable light source from behind the system as well, so we can get uh, the specimen illuminated. And then this is the micro DIC system. So this is a fairly new product. Um, and this essentially uh, gets a higher magnification and it's all integrated into one package. Uh, so you can see the light source is there. We have the extension tubes connected to the lenses, the cameras, and everything's very rigid to one another. Um, but the most important um, difference is that the depth of field, which I mean, and I have an illustration of this on another slide, I can share with you another time, um, which illustrates how the depth of field is parallel on the surface of the specimen. So we get uh, a much higher uh, or much higher resolution, crisper image from each camera, which results in more accurate data. Okay, and then lastly, here's so here's the microscope setup. So this has the uh, Olympus zoom body with the objective lens. Um, you can see the um, 
the light would travel through the objective lens. Here, this is the beam splitter, and the light would come bounce up through some mirrors into each camera. And they're so they're angled a little bit. So this is set up in our lab. Um, so it's essentially pre, I don't want to say calibrated, calibrated, but in some ways it is before uh, you receive the system. Then we put the whole system on a motorized stage as well, so that you can move it um, towards the specimen, but also uh, in the X, Y direction as well, because that's needed to perform the calibration uh, for the system. And then you can see here on, uh, in, in the uh, tensile frame, we have a backlit um, calibration fixture. So you can see there's some really small calibration targets on there. Um, so when performing DIC under a microscope, um, we have to um, perform a distortion correction. Um, I have to speed up a little bit and get, get a little carried away here. Uh, so what that means is we cannot perform a, a standard uh, calibration procedure. We, we have to, in, in addition to that, uh, measure the complex non-radial distortions in the microscope. So we do that by translating a speckle grid um, in the microscope so that uh, we can remove those distortions. So you can see on the left here, this is a, a shape measurement of an optical flat. And on the left side is where we have not applied the distortion correction. And on the right, you see that's where we have applied the distortion correction. So we're removing all that bias. And we're the only company that has this in our software. Other companies just don't, don't even do this and you get really biased data. All right, so moving into the application example. So we have a chip uh, on a circuit board and we cut the chip in the circuit board and we want to measure the cross section as it's being thermally loaded. So you can see the little area of interest there, and we're gonna load it um, at those uh, 20, 50, 80, and 110 degrees Celsius, and then back. And th this is what we had. And by the way, this speckle pattern was applied with an airbrush system. So we get a pretty nice speckle pattern on that small field of view. And the field of view is three millimeters here. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, the purple is representing the uh, com compression strain. Um, on the basically the adhesive interface where the grease is. And then here you can see the strain concentration as well on the, on the edge, which may be maybe some sort of crack or defect. And then on the right, we're graphing the strain um, in that rectangular region um, at different temperatures. And here we're showing the same, but now we're showing the first principle strain in the area where the adhesive is. And there's a 3D plot of that same data. Okay, so moving on to high speed. Um, this is an example of a, um, an airbag deployment. So lots of interest in the automotive industry on uh, how the airbag deploys. Is it deploying uh, the right time, but also is it, is it, uh, uh, is it deforming or uh, leaving the cover in the right location is very important. So for, for safety reasons. And so this is what our customer here was wanting to do. This is the airbag cover on the passenger side of a vehicle. And they have a design location where they expect the, the cover to fail. So we image the cover uh, using high speed cameras. And what we actually noticed here was the um, airbag cover was folding in at the fault line where it should actually be straining there and, and failing. So what was happening is the airbag was was um, putting pressure on the upper region of the cover and failing in that location. So uh, being able to not only just see that happen, but also make the measurements, um, help them improve their design and ultimately you know, improve the safety of, of, the, um, of the airbag. Okay, next example is uh, what we call our high speed vibration analysis or FFT system. Um, and essentially what this does is it measures uh, deflection shapes. So if you have an object that's um, subject to some sort of force which makes it vibrate and excite um, operation deflection shapes or, or commonly known as like um, a type of mode shape, um, we're able to analyze the images um, during that excitation using high-speed cameras, which you can see in the next image here. But we have two high-speed cameras mounted on a bar looking at a brake rotor. And we take that brake rotor and uh, we hit it with a, with a hammer. Um, it's isolated from the ground um, using just some, some rubber pieces. And then we hit it with a small hammer 
and the brake rotor vibrates, but you hear like a ringing noise. Um, so we want to be able to measure those shapes. So we take images, and once we when we analyze the displacements, uh, we get a very you know looks like a very noisy signal. Um, but what we then do is perform um, a fast Fourier transformation on that displacement history data to transform into a frequency domain. So now we're able to actually like see the brake rotor at different um, at vibrating at different frequencies and also measure the amplitude. So this on the left side shows the average amplitude um, of the brake rotor. So we can very quickly identify multiple operation reflection shapes, measure the frequencies, and also measure the amplitudes and, and shapes. So looking at this graph is not, not super exciting, but if we look at the data, it, it's, it's very clear what's happening to, to the brake rotor. Uh, here we're showing the X, Y, and Z um, amplitudes across the whole field. And then on the bottom right there is the, the actual, actual shape. And um, what we're really impressed to see here is the amplitudes were very, very small. So this was at 932 hertz, but the amplitudes are on the order of just a few hundred nanometers. And we're, we're able to resolve that because uh, we're taking thousands of images. So before with a quasi-static test, you might take 100, maybe 200 images. But for a vibration test like this, we typically take about 3,000 images. And what that allows us to do is like during those 3,000 images, that, that shape is happening, but it's very hard to detect by just analyzing images um, if you were just analyze 100. But if you analyze 3,000, uh, we get more and more images at that same shape, and then we can lower the noise floor of the measurement. And so if you look back to this graph, you know, the noise floor is actually way down here, which is on the order of um, just a few nanometers. This, is, uh, this scale over here is in millimeters. So this five to the negative five is 50 nanometers. So really, really, really small um, amplitudes. And then here, of course, we can, we can animate those. So here you can actually see how the brake rotor is, is vibrating. Um, we've done lots of tests with you know, different pieces of materials, glass, metals, um, turbines, or, or turbine blades, I should say, like from, from uh, turbine engines, uh, it's a very popular application to be able to um, view, analyze, and reduce you know, vibrations from, from you know, turbine engines. It's really important. Um, of course, this is just a, a pretty common automotive application. So the way this works is we, we can only measure the frequencies at half the frame rate of the camera. So um, those, those amplitudes you, or those frequencies you saw were up to about 2000, but we did sample at about 10,000 frames per second or something like that. Um, so we've, we've been able to measure up to about four or five kilohertz uh, deflection shapes. Um, typically at those really high frequencies, the amplitudes are, get smaller and smaller the higher the frequency. So uh, without having the ability to actually, you know, impact something very violently um, to get the high frequencies to show some amplitudes um, can, be, can be somewhat challenging. But, you know, theoretically 50 kilohertz uh, shapes is possible. Um, very small size scales, we, can, we could actually put um, a couple of high speed cameras on the microscope um, up to about 3000 frames per second or so uh, on the microscope. Um, so we can measure resolve very small amplitudes. It's very integrated. Um, and this has uh, um, uh, kind of a, a, new, a new approach to measuring these deflection shapes compared to laser vibrometer systems. Um, so you may have um, heard of laser vibrometer systems before, but what they do is they, um, if you were to measure, if you get like a 1D system, you have one laser scanner pointing at an object, the object's vibrating you know, towards the laser and the laser does a scan. So you have to continuously vibrate the surface while the scan is happening and that can take 30, 40 minutes. Um, now, if you want to measure the in-plane with the laser system, you need a second laser system. And you know, a 3D laser system can run five, $600,000. Um, so using DIC to, to generate very similar data um, is cheaper uh, and it's much faster. And you get, you know, two systems in one, really. You have a dynamic strain measurement system and a frequency analysis system. So um, 
there's lots of different advantages there. The acquisition time is very short. Um, you can identify, you know, multiple ODSs at, 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 with one test. Um, and also you can measure uh, objects that are vibrating and deforming at the same time. If you think about a hinge uh, object or a door slamming or an engine start or something like that, where something is gradually changing during the event, it's, it's no problem for this system where, um, you know, laser systems can, can struggle with that. All right, so a um, couple more examples to go here. Um, this is an example of courtesy of um, a couple of uh, customers and grad students from Virginia Tech. Uh, so they have a system and they also have an infrared camera. So they wanted to be able to measure um, without any contact of this on the sample, the temperature distribution and the strain. So um, we developed a system where you can actually have the infrared camera um, mounted to the same bar or maybe not to the same bar, but um, integrated with the DIC system. So we actually wrote some software to acquire images of well, from the infrared camera alongside the, uh, the white light cameras for the DIC and which allowed us to be able to um, synchronize the data essentially. And so we went, we went a step further. Um, we were like, well, let's calibrate this camera. How can we figure out uh, the data we get from this, this infrared camera? Let's make sure it's in the same coordinate system as the DIC data. Um, so we like, let's calibrate it. So like you saw earlier in the slides where we were calibrating the DIC system. Um, so this is actually an inverse of the one you saw earlier, but this is essentially a black anodized aluminum target with some laser etch markers. And we're able to get a good uh, a DIC calibration image from this target. And also if we heat it up a little bit um, to about 100F, we're able to get a high resolution, high contrast um, calibration image in the infrared camera. So we take the same, same amount of images with the infrared camera so that we can calibrate the intrinsic parameters of the infrared camera. And then also because all cameras can see the same dots, we're able to calculate the position of the infrared camera relative to the DIC system. So now with the data we get from the, temp, from the IR camera, we can project onto the DIC data and right there in our software, you can see temperature or strain. Um, so these are the raw images you're seeing. Now the speckle pattern um, is uh, something to think about because you don't want the um, emissivity differences in the pattern to affect the temperature data. Uh, so what these guys did is they, they figured out, well, if we put a pretty thick black coat of paint on here and some fine white dots, we don't see any temperature gradient in the infrared image. So that's how that was achieved. And this is the result. So um, the specimen has been compressed and loaded with a heat, with a, um, a heat source from behind it. And the, at the top there, you're seeing the longitudinal strain. And on the bottom, you see the temperature from the infrared camera. So uh, it's always nice if I'm trying to pause it here, but see here where it buckles, you can see the cooling down here. And then on the top, you see where, see where it buckles and you see this, the um, strain distribution. Now I will just mention the color distribution here is looks a little bit noisy, but that's due to some video rendering um, on my end. So, but this is what uh, the screenshot looks like of the data. So you can, you can clearly see where these, the surface of the specimen blisters, it delaminates, and you can see the strain concentration around those areas. And then you can, uh, you can also measure the, the temperature in those areas. So um, more of another common application for this is thermal um, deformation on chips, uh, computer chips, CPUs, they get really hot. Uh, there's lots of research in that area, uh, but this gives you the ability to completely measure local coefficient of um, thermal expansion at different areas on your specimen. And, and really you know, measure warpage and all sorts of um, useful, useful data you can get from the system. And that's just showing the outer plane displacement there. So, the, and then this just shows the extraction. So you see where I have these, these two points here um, on the next slide is showing the uh, temperature uh, when it, when it uh, delaminates here versus the, the strain. So on the top of here, you see strain and here, I'm sorry, temperature, and then on the bottom you see strain. 
Okay, and uh, here's my last example. So um, this is um, called volumetric image correlation or DVC, digital volume correlation um, is, a, is a pretty common um, term for this uh, technique of measuring internal deformation. So now all we've talked about is surface deformation, surface strain. So here's, um, how, you know, how do we figure out what's going on in the material? We, we have models that can show us this. Let's try and measure it. Um, how do we measure it? Well, we need images through the material. How do we get images through the material? We need a CT scanner or an X-ray. So this is a theoretical um, depiction of what this would um, look like in the material if we were to push down on this, this material and you see the screen field. So um, this is a quite a bit more of a complex um, uh, acquisition of data. So you essentially have a specimen um, in, in the middle of a scanner and you need to scan the material, scan through the, the material and either the scanner needs to rotate or the object needs to rotate. Typically, the object is, is uh, rotated. Um, so in order to, to test our um, code for this, we set up a, um, a test of a rubber material. So essentially like a hockey puck. Um, we got the hockey puck and be, um, before, we didn't just buy an off the shelf one, we, we manufactured one because the trick here is now we need a speckle pattern through the material. And that's not a color contrast, that is a change in density. So what you're seeing here, these white specks here are sand particles. So sand was added to the uncured rubber before it was um, cured. And then we're able, when we scan it, we get a pretty high contrast speckle image through the material. Um, so the next challenge is, okay, we need to scan and image this material but we also need to be able to rotate it and not only just rotate it, but the load needs to remain, remain unchanged during that rotation. Mm -hmm. So this uh, fixture was designed to, and it's acrylic fixture. So it has a very low, um, different density compared to the uh, rubber material. And then it's, so it's, it's scanned once undeformed and then scanned again, deformed, deformed. And the result is we now get strain um, through the material. So we, had, we were able to um, uh, compute the Z component of the strain. So before we got you know, XX, YY, YZ, first, second principles, but we never were able to get the through strain. Now we can get that uh, utilizing the, the software and imaging devices. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here with a couple more slides. This just basically shows the uh, overall specifications of our big 3D system, which is essentially most of the applications that we demonstrated today. Um, up to 5 million frames per second is achievable with a very, very fast and fairly expensive camera system. Uh, but anywhere from, you know, one hertz to 5 million hertz is possible. Um, the size range scales is, is quite, quite large, you know, all the way from 800 microns to, you know, 100 meters is possible. Um, theoretically, we can actually go higher than um, 100 meters. Um, there's a different calibration procedure for that. Our in-plane displacement resolution, um, this is a very generalized number, one over 100,000 times the field of view, but it's actually about a hundredth of a pixel, and the out-of-plane is about um, a fiftieth of a pixel. So that can change a little bit depending on the camera resolution, but it's not, it's not, super, it's not super proportional to the resolution of the camera. Um, for example, a five megapixel camera is 2,500 by 2,000 pixels. A 10 megapixel camera is not double the resolution in each direction. So we don't get twice the resolution in the displacements. And the trade-off for higher resolution cameras is typically noise too. So higher resolution cameras, you have more data, more pixels, but you also have more noise. Um, so, you know, these are fairly general rule of thumb of uh, in-plane and out-of-plane displacement resolution. So to put that in perspective, a 100, 100 millimeter field of view gets you about plus or minus one micron in-plane displacement and about plus or minus two microns of out-of-plane displacement resolution. Strains about plus or minus 50 micro strain range, you know, anywhere from 50 or 100 up to micro strain up to over 2000%. Uh, we've, the, the calibration procedure is super automatic now, it's super fast, lots of different um, calibration options in terms of uh, calibrating like in a tank, for example, we have an algorithm that can uh, calculate uh, refraction uh, indexes across the field. 
Um, you can use multiple stereo systems and do data stitching. So if you want to image a 360 degrees around a cylinder or a sphere, uh, that's no problem. And we have uh, lots of real-time capabilities that I mentioned earlier. Um, Here's some of our exclusive features of our software. We have an all new graphics engine, uh, which makes it really easy and fast to make beautiful presentations, video animations, and all sorts. There's lots of cool stuff on our YouTube channel. Um, super fast image processing, real time, et cetera. Um, you can kind of read them for yourself. And um, I can provide this information to you afterwards as well. Uh, here's our different camera options. So uh, our most common system would be like the five megapixel system here, um, but we're actually selling quite a lot of 12s. And then we have this boost camera, which gives you a little faster frame rates. Uh, we introduced some new 10 gig cameras and you can see there's a new 31 megapixel available there. And then high speed, there's quite a wide range of high speed cameras that, that we support as well. And when I mean support, you know, we actually do write software to control these cameras where we can integrate a DAC as well. We're not using the native software to, to acquire the data. And that, that's all I have for you guys today. I I'm, thank you so much for um, being very patient with me and uh, I will open up the floor for any questions. Great, thank you very much, Alistair. Um, all, all we can do is a uh, virtual clapping in the world we live in now. So uh, anybody- uh... Might be muted, Brian. Oh no, hold on one second, my speaker is off. Got it. Got it. Okay, I can hear you now. Great. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. And um, we are. Uh, you can tell it's easy to get enthusiastic about this technology. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> I'm yeah, the, I'm the same way when I talk about it too. So uh, um, thank you all for hanging in there. And I hope that the people that ask questions can hang on. And if you can't, I will uh, get back to you um, through uh, Alistair and I will communicate, and I can get back to you later with answers to your questions. But here's what we've got in the chat. The, the first question is, um, what's the smallest space you've put an image correlation system within? Um, I'm thinking of something inside a tool as an example. So, so Dick, mm -hmm. is that inside like a machining tool, like a lathe or a mill kind of thing or a CNC? Well, that or even a manufacturing tool uh, out mm -hmm. on a production floor something that maybe bends wires. I'm thinking really small areas. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the main issue with that is being able to get cameras small enough and also um, decent enough sensors to use for those type applications. There was one um, experiment I helped with where we got basically two phone cameras, um, image sensors and with the lens and put them on a very small bar and we had them angled uh, a little bit, and then we wanted to image inside a tube. Um, so we, we poked the cameras to a hole and imaged inside the tube. Um, it was it was pretty bad. The the, the strain noise was around two three thousand micro strain. Um, so the the problem there is is utilizing image sensors that are not designed for scientific purposes. Uh, there's just so much noise in those images. It's it's not very practical. Um, so the smallest, um, you know, the, the, um, the, some of the cameras we use get down to about one inch cubed each. So that's about the, I mean, and, and you could probably take them a custom design your own fixture to get it a little bit smaller than that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. So I mean, if, if you can deal with 300, 3000 micro strain of noise, then it's possible. Um, boroscopes, same, same problem. The distortions are just really bad on the lenses and you know they're all color sensors and really small sensors and just really noisy. And uh, the next question is about high speed applications. Is that mostly limited by the frame rate and exposure of the camera? Um, yes, so, no, and also resolution. Um, you, you'll see a lot of high speed cameras advertised as 2 million frames per second, but the resolution is 16 by eight pixels. Not good for the IC. So um, typical off the shelf high speed cameras such as like Phantom Photon, uh, we can get up to about 300,000 frames per second at a usable resolution, which may be like 128 by 128 pixels. That's about the lowest I've, I've done on a Hopkins and Bar test. Mm -hmm. Now uh, there is another camera system um, called uh, manufactured by Shimatsu 
uh, which has a fixed resolution of 400 by 250 pixels, and that can do 5 million frames per second at that resolution. So, you know, the, the cameras are a quarter million dollars each. So put it into perspective, you know, it's, a, it's an expensive system, um, but can be utilized for really fast dynamic um, events. But I, but I think there's some very good options within sort of machine type um, range of vibrations, you know, like you were saying in the few thousand to 50,000 hertz sort of range, and then you've got sure. more, more possibilities. Yeah, the, there's a lot of affordable options in the um, yeah, small range from 500 to maybe 50,000 frames per second. Um, any, we, we typically refer to high speed cameras as having their own, uh, their own onboard memory because they have to save images. That's the only way they can save them so quickly is the onboard RAM. Um, so yeah, that typically starts at around 500, maybe a thousand frames per second. And then there's a question for thermal applications of composites, how would the heating work? And that, that's kind of getting more into just the experimental design aspects of this, I think. Correct? Right. I will just mention, you have to be careful that, that the heat in the air, the, the uh, delta um, heat change in the air can, can greatly affect the images. You can get basically heat waves in your images, which can distort the measurements very severely. So it's important to uh, really think about where the heat source is located, how you're heating it. And if you, if you have to, um, uh, if you cannot um, heat it in a way where there is no um, thermal currents, you use a fan, um, which is typically used almost all the time for any high temperature applications. You have a fan, not necessarily blowing onto your specimen, but to move the air between the surface that's being heated and the cameras. Yep. And a uh, couple of questions on speckles. Um, can we control speckle size? What is the minimum size possible? Um, that's a pretty open question, but uh, yeah, um, you can control the size. Uh, if you use a printed pattern or use like one of our speckle rollers, so we have the same dots on the roller and you can roll this, the, the dots on there and you have a very consistent size. Um, they, they go down to 0.013 inches. So it's like you know, about a millimeter or so. Um, then uh, for smaller than that, uh, people typically use an airbrush system and which can be somewhat inconsistent dot size, but small enough where you know if it's variable if it's a little bit variable that's okay you just don't want to have like big blobs and small dots next to each other mm -hmm. um and they the their brush will put out you know just a few micron size dots maybe like 20 microns maybe 30 micron dots so that they're, they're, they're pretty small um and uh, so and if, if the speckles are damaged by local heating or stress during measurement um that has some effect of, of yeah. course it sure does. Uh, it, if you're say your dot was there in one image, it's not in the next, and you're gonna lose a data point there. You're not gonna have a good match anymore. Um, using larger subsets and using some filtering can help kind of smooth that out. Uh, but you, you definitely need, your pattern needs to survive the process, uh, the deformation process. Now, we do allow for some things to change, such as even like um, uh, change in the, um, light, like all your, your speckle pattern get lighter or darker, um, whether it's lighting change or if it's um, your specimen actually deforming and changing color, like plastic, for example, that, that's okay if it's done gradually. Mm -hmm. um, and you have images taken, we do a photo, photometric metric mapping from one subset to the next and we can handle some light changes. Mm -hmm. so, and um, a question about imaging through uh, through transparent plates or screens could these measurements mm -hmm. be taken through a transparent screen um, or into a or into a tank of some kind through a window yeah I think I briefly touched on that earlier um, it's called um, it's a new algorithm that we developed a couple of years ago called variable rate origin there's a whole presentation on just that mm -hmm. uh, but essentially what we're doing is instead of um, uh, using the pinhole model for the calibration um, procedure for each camera we're allowing that um, pinhole to move. We're allowing it to intersect the plane. And uh, that's, that can be due to refraction index um, through imaging a, through a glass pane or into a tank, for example. Um, so it, the, the process is quite easy. You just calibrate, you know, if you had a, a looking into a tank in the water tank, you would calibrate in the tank and just click a button in the software and it would compute the, 
the correct um, correct parameters. But it is important to note that that does come part of the calibration. So you cannot move your tank anymore, um, you know, for or, or window, for example. So, um, but yeah, it is possible. Yep, I've seen Hubert present on that very very nicely. Um, so this is from, a, I know, a local industry representative that does thermal work. Um, does, your, does your software support multi-stereo DIC in order to measure expansion of a large sample with two stereo camera systems mounted apart at both ends of the sample? So mm -hmm. other, can you coordinate a couple of stereo systems with each other? I love these questions. They're excellent. Um, so we um, originally when we developed the way to stitch data together the systems had to have some overlap uh, and we used the overlap between each system to be able to uh, fit mm -hmm. one data set from one system into coordinate system of the other system well what we did was like um, instead of uh, how do we get around doing this well we we take a, a rigid object basically like a bar like and we put a speckle pattern on both sides of the bar so you have two systems imaging, say one one blade and one tip of the blade, and then another system imaging the base. And if we can get a bar that the speckle pattern is visible in both of the uh, stereo systems, and we can move it and tilt it a little bit, almost like the same kind of calibration procedure, then uh, by computing the angles of each one of those speckle patterns in each system, images are taken at the same time. Uh, we can then triangulate the systems uh, relative to one another. So we can figure out from those angles how far they are away from each other. It also works for facing systems as well. So you have two systems looking at each other and you want to image two sides of your specimen. We do a similar procedure where we have a speckle pattern on both sides of your calibration board and we mm -hmm. tilt and move it around. We're also able to uh, calculate the, the, how the systems are away from each other. And then you can measure thinning of your material. Interesting, that bar, that bar technique, I wasn't, wasn't aware of that one. Yeah. Um, so, um, so a question about nat natural texture, which is kind of one of my deals. Um, mm -hmm. Would grain boundary patterns from a small grain material work as a speckle pattern, if you could image them reasonably well? Um, so, yeah, yes, but with, with limitation, I mean, you have to use big subsets, basically, mm -hmm. because you have, it, it depends on the magnification, but if your grain boundaries are, say, 100 pixels apart, then you're going to have to use probably, you know, close to 100 by 100 pixel subset um, across the field in order to uh, measure the strain using that pattern, and that can result in poor spatial resolution. Um, so that can be an issue too. Um, another, uh, the last question I think that I have here is from uh, um, from Dong Wah. I can get back to you on that one, Dong Wah, with some detail. But for the 3D CT scan. Um, will we have to add particles to a material in order to get that to work? Because that could potentially change material characteristics. That's correct. Um, so I I will jump in here. That's that's kind of kind of my my realm a little bit. And I know that that example that you showed um, in the beginning of the volumetric, where you had kind of the green colored puck with the porous material in it that that's actually that was experimental data that i collected and mm -hmm. that actually used the the porous structure itself as a source mm -hmm. of as a source of uh patterning okay i was just going to mention transparent materials so you can actually speckle the front of a transparent like film and backlight it mm -hmm. so you don't have to put a white base coat on there that's another um interesting way of speckling up I've, I've seen too yes and so the, when you get into natural texture, whether it's volumetric or anything else, as I think Alistair is, is pointing out, you, you get into a realm where you do have potentially more noise and you have to be a bit more cautious about interpreting results. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it is uh, one thing I've really appreciated about correlated over the years is, is when they tell you that they will measure something to this precision, they're, they, they're, they're confident in that and they know what they're saying. And so um, it's, it's easy to oversell by saying, yes, that will measure just fine. But in, in some cases, it is more challenging. Um, controlling speckle pattern is a pretty important. Yeah, we, we like to say we, we sell solutions to problems, not, you know, not we're not just selling a product to anyone. We want to make sure it's going to work for you. And a lot of times we'll actually we'll put in the time to set up a system and do the demo before you know, committing to selling something. We want to make sure it's going to work. 
I, I think we we actually worked our way through all the questions and there's oh, great. there's lots of uh, there's lots of um, the later chat messages were just thanking you for the presentation. I think a lot of people really and really enjoyed hearing what you oh, have great. to say. And, and the range of examples was was really very good. And I know in particular that uh, um, the issue of large samples and coordinating calibration um, with with a uh, with a calibration target on a on a the ends of a bar kind of thing is a really interesting idea, and that's something I'd like to know more about as well. If you go if you go to our support site, there's um an application note there called uh, multi view red uh, multi view calibration from registrations, and it's a little mm -hmm. uh, application note about how that's done. If you want to check that out. Um, just another thing to throw out there too. Um, I, I know there's probably some um, professors maybe interested in teaching DIC. Uh, we have an educational system that's that's pretty uh, inexpensive, and we've we've just released uh, four labs for it too. So you can um, right out the box start teaching DIC um, with those labs. So, um, and I actually I actually have one of those educational systems. And we're going to be sending you the labs and the fixture that goes with it too. We're going to send that out to everyone. Great, and um, I've I've had very good luck with it. I've even loaned it to student groups to use for projects they were doing, and they've had they've had good success with it. So anybody on campus, I'm happy to let you let you take have a go at that system if you want to if you want to have a look at it. And um, any anything else that anybody would like, that you, you're welcome to unmute at this point and, um, and un, un camera if you want to. There's a question about calibrating large spaces. Um, oh, there we go. One more question. Yes. That's that, that. Um, so to calibrate large spaces where it's not practical to have a calibration target uh, to fill up the field of view, uh, what we do is we calibrate the cameras individually first. So there's a point from, uh, from the camera to infinity where everything's in focus. So you basically walk up to each camera with a calibration target. It's about one meter in size. And you, you calibrate each camera separately. That cal calculates all the intrinsic parameters. And then in order to triangulate the position of the, the cameras from one another, uh, we need to know the distance between two points on the surface of your specimen. So that could be um, you know, on a wall, just two locations. And you can mark that with, you can either use markers or you can just draw like a noticeable cross or something in your speckle pattern. And in the software, you click with those two points and then enter in the, the distance and, and that's it. And we do use the speckle pattern too to, to improve that um, stereo calibration. So it's, it's, it's best to have a good speckle pattern on the surface too. Um, large speckle patterns typically require stencils of some kind. Um, there's um, a very good example on a website where NASA did a 28 foot diameter cylinder and they, they stenciled the whole thing and speckled the whole thing. But to them, it was worth the time because it's like, you know, you have millions of points instead of just individual points everywhere. So the largest area I managed to uh, calibrate the, the regular way was 10 foot by 10 foot. And uh, I printed a large calibration target oh, on a <laughs> stiff uh, background piece of piece That's of tough plywood. because the calibration target mustn't deform. It's got to be rigid. So mm -hmm. if you have a really large target like that, it's, it can be difficult to make it rigid enough and, and not super heavy unless you had it hanging from something. Um, <laughs> It's actually best to do it the other way because you're uh, correcting for lens distortions much better by having your calibration target in the corners, you know, of, of both images, both cameras, and then just having the distance between those two points measured. And there's different devices you can use to do that. Um, but the largest dimension you can put in the image, uh, that's what you So if you can go to corner to corner, um, any kind of error in your initial measurement between those two points will be minimized um, by the proportion to the distance. Yeah, and I just to, just to, to add a comment on calibration, I, I think for the stereo DIC systems, you know, calibration is such an important part of it. And I think Correlated has, has, is really a leader in developing new methodology calibration and, and making them work. And I know Hubert puts a lot of effort there and, and finding new ways to calibrate in different situations and making sure that it works correctly. Yeah. So I think there's Ab been a lot of good absolutely. developments there. Um, and in fact, for applications where you have to use like wide lenses or you have to, you have a very small stereo angle, 
will recommend performing a hybrid calibration where you take additional images of a speckled target and uh, we'll use the, um, uh, the, the co correlation of the speckled target to further improve the calibration. And that's shown to do a really good job, especially with distortions and lenses um, and limiting bias. And I, actually, Dong Wah put another, if, feel free to, to unmute Dong Wah if you'd like to, but, uh, and, but Dong Wah's asking it. Is yeah, it you, can, you can read it out, yeah. Is it possible to resolve right. something as small as tens of nanometers local deformation zone, such as a, a shear band? Yeah, that's, it's tricky. Your, your best option is probably use the SEM um, mm -hmm. to get that small. However, the, the microscope system at the smallest field of view can resolve around 10 or 20 nanometers of in-plane displacement. Mm -hmm. um, the outer plane is a little bit, it's gonna be noisier because of the limited stereo angle and other factors. Um, but the in-plane we can resolve about 10 to 20 nanometers. Yeah, I think, I think for some of these problems like shear banding, in-plane would probably give you a lot of the information. Mm, right. So that, yeah. that might be useful there, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. well, great. Well, Brian, thanks for so much for setting this up. This is great. And anytime in the future you want to do this, and this goes out to everyone, um, I'm more than happy to talk about DIC and, and um, you know, uh, give some more exposure. So just let me know. Fantastic. Thank you very much for uh, so maybe, maybe a last round of thanks for Alistair, for the people that hung in there. Appreciate everybody's uh, attention and the questions were great. And I think we, we learned a lot. And uh, let's uh, let's let's yeah. call it a wrap. Yeah.